saying, sending out our commission on mission, the global peace plan. In the last days, Jesus was most concerned about our mission. Towards the last few days, he, he began to start talking about the future and start talking about, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to send the Spirit of God and you're going to be my witnesses, etc., etc. The night before the crucifixion, Jesus prayed in the same way that you, Father, gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. You know, the disciples started hearing Jesus talk about the future and handing over and going away and sending the spirit. And they began to understand, wow, okay, enough of following him and enjoying him. Now it's time for us to do. The, the years are coming when I have to do. After his resurrection, he said, go make disciples of all nations. Before his ascension, the disciples said, Lord, when are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? I mean, after all, you were supposed to be a political lead. Jesus replied, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set, but when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Judea Samaria. Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Okay, so our mission to the whole world is to be simultaneously, simultaneous. It is, you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the world. Judea, Jerusalem, and Judea, and Samaria, and the end. It does not say Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. Got it? It doesn't say then, then, then. It says and, and, and. So, God wants your small little church. And if you, even if you have thousand, it's still small only in this city. Right? If you have, God wants your small little church to be a global evangelistic church. A global evangelistic church. What does that mean? How on earth does God want a church to be global? How does God want every church to think globally? Because we think <clears throat> only American churches can do that. You know, only mega churches can do that. You know, the, church, the pastor has to be have, has to have super personality and super influence to be able to get his stuff all over the world and get his people all over the world. That is a fallacious idea of, of missions. That is not how God wanted it to be. Here's how God wanted it to be. God wants you in Dwarka to work with him in Almora to plant a church together in Chhattisgarh. And that's how you go global. You work with other churches. I have to work with other churches. But I don't like them. I don't like the way they worship. I don't like the way you know they teach. I don't like their theology. I don't like their culture. Uh -huh. Welcome to the church. Welcome to the body of Christ. 2,000 years the gospel has been in India. And we are a pathetic 3% on paper. 2,000 years, Thomas, the most doubtful one. <laughs> he traveled the longest. <coughs> came all the way. And missionaries through the, through the years, they came all the way. Most of the translation work, the best translation work happened in this country. So the best missionaries and well-known missionaries came to this country. The gospel came a long, long time ago. But everyone came to their own. Like Jesus. He came to his own, but his own rejected him. Everyone came to their own. So you had what was known as coastal regions. So at the coast, you had in a missional movement in the late 1800s or early 1900s, you had people coming and setting up churches. So you go to Goa, you go to Chennai, you go to Calcutta, you got all these churches that were set up. And it was, it, it was called a mimic of photocopy church, right? So if you had the Lutheran church here, they would come and set up a Lutheran church here. It's Lutheran. It's Methodist. You don't go anywhere else. Okay? That's it. I'm making fun of it because it's funny. Then they did copies. Then from there, it moved on into inland missions. Got it? Because coastal ho gaya. Now I had to move inside, internal, into the... So we called it inland. I don't know if you're old enough to remember the, <laughs> the period when we... Inland missions. That was the big thing. Inland missions. From inland missions, it became people groups. 
people groups okay now we go to unreached people groups right UUPGs okay so we we are now moving into every possible scenario but the problem is that if you're going to uh, if you're going to copy yourself if you're going to copy yourself you are segregating people so the missionaries did great by bringing the gospel but didn't do great by putting on a tie and a suit on a headhunter in Mizoram. Work with me. Just, just work with me. You can disagree, but just work with me. They didn't do great with telling them, abandon everything that is locally cultural, locally ethnic, <laughs> abandon them, become something else. And both in theolo theology and in culture, we were segregating one another. And today the task that you and I have is to unite a church that wants to stay within four walls. And the answer is purpose driven. That's why I believe in it. It's not, it's not for any other reason. The only reason I believe in it is because this is a great way where you and I can leave our worship and our theology and all of that separate and we can work together to serve the purposes of God in this world and bring the gospel to every single person. How does God want a church to go local? How do you do a ministry in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the rest of the world by hooking up with churches by working with churches get over yourself get over your idiosyncrasies get over your own little ways of thing, and be willing to yeah no no yeah there's gonna be 20% where you disagree it's okay it's okay you don't agree with me on half a lot of things I don't agree with you in, in fact you don't even like half of what I do and even how I say it it doesn't matter it's not about me this whole conference, this entire, it's not about me. If you both go home, two of you hook up and you have a thing and you decide to do something together, success! That's success. That's all we need. This is not about you partnering even with me. This is about you getting the vision and then saying, oh, you're close to me. Let's go and help him out. He says that, yeah, let's go, let's go. Great! Tell me, Pastor Jerry, I'll be on my knees praying for you. That, that's what it's all about. So three ands, not three Thens. Three ands, not three thens. Our mission is the global glory of God. Isaiah 49 says, God had, had to expand Isaiah's vision to understand, Isaiah, you're depressed because your vision is too small. Your vision is too small. So he says, you are my servant in, where, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. He's depressed. He's like, all my work is going in vain. I've spent my strength. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, it is too small a thing for you, my servant, to just restore only the tribes of Jacob and just bring Israel back. This a kame. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth so pastor friend loved one minister fellow fellow laborer in the gospel god wants your church to be global how by being part of the global church by being part of the globe you don't have to join another denomination or change your beliefs but there can be a strategy in which churches can work together with churches in order to serve other churches and to serve things. the church is the hope of the world the church is the hope of the world. Jesus believed in the church. Jesus shed his blood for the church. Jesus empowered the church. Jesus mandated the church. And Jesus commissioned the church. And Jesus is coming back for the church. Not for Red Cross. Not for every court. Not for the UN. Not for Africa. Not for Asia. Not for America. The church. He's given the task to the church. Our mission is the global glory of God are you picking up the heart of this yeah. okay so if we are the global power super global power the church today sitting here you know from Nepal to Kanyakumari if we're sitting here where we are the church then what are the five major things major problems major uh, challenges that are global that only the global church can meet are you with me what are global challenges that UN can't meet, Red Cross can't meet, but the church, if we hold hands together, we can meet. What are the global challenges? Here are five. Number one, spiritual emptiness. Spiritual emptiness. Every, every nation, every people group experiences spiritual darkness, 
spiritual emptiness. Everything is meaningless, utterly meaningless. What do people get for all of their hard work? Generations come and go, but nothing else changes. Everything is so weary and tiresome. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are never content. Everybody has a khalipan, koklapan, emptiness. Got it? The second problem is self-serving leadership or corrupt leadership. Every culture, every language, sorry, every, every country, everyone has corrupt leadership. Everyone has corrupt leadership. So that's a global problem as well. There isn't a country that doesn't have corrupt leadership. Without wise leadership, a nation fails without vision. You're, you're, you, you've observed how godless leaders throw their weight around. And when you get a little power, how quickly it goes to their heads. That's a loose version of Mark chapter 10 verse 42. As surely as I'm the living God, you had better listen to me. My sheep have been attacked by wild animals that killed and ate them because the shepherds did not care. They didn't find the sheep. Number three, the third global problem is extreme poverty. Extreme poverty. Poverty to yes, some Some poverty is there, but extreme poverty where you're not able to get a meal. You're eating once in perhaps two, three, four, five days. And while 20% of the population of the world carries all of its, in, uh, its wealth, the vast majority of the world isn't eating well. They don't have nourishing food, they don't have regular food, they don't have water, they don't have basics. Extreme poverty. Number four, pandemic diseases. Pandemic diseases. When we say pandemic diseases, we're saying there are certain diseases that don't have to be. They've been eradicated in, in some countries completely. Like malaria, like, like uh, give me another exa example. Polio. 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 Yeah, they've been eradicated completely. Yet there are st it's still in some of our countries. Why? Why is it still a pandemic diseases which don't need to be are still in some of our countries. Again, we're living in a broken world. There will always be sickness. But there are global problems that a global power, a global community can resolve. Pandemic disease. And lastly, there's the deprivation of education. There's a lack or loss of education, especially for the girl child, especially for the girl child. All are struggling with that. Poor people are struggling with that. But particularly women are not, girls are not educated. In fact, there's a whole set of problems under that, which we, which we could take, take a look at. Okay, let's go over them. Five global giants. Number one. Spiritual emptiness. Number two, self-serving leadership. Number three, extreme poverty. Number four, pandemic diseases. Number five, deprivation. And only one group can handle this. Only one group can handle this. And that is the church. That is the church. What did Jesus do? Number one, number one, he promoted reconciliation to God and to each other. He planted churches. He planted churches that promoted reconciliation. He planted not only in his lifetime, but through the apostles, he planted churches. He says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, overcome it. Two kinds of reconciliation are possible through Jesus. Number one, Jesus ends our conflict with God and brings peace. That answers the problem of spiritual emptiness, spiritual darkness. That answers the problem. Okay, so the spiritual darkness, plant churches. And the second that reconciliation Jesus says, Jesus ends our conflict with each other. And brings peace with each other. Together as one body, Christ reconciled all groups to God by means of his death. And our hostility, hostility to each other is put to death. There is therefore now no division between anyone. And Christ has become the wall between us. He is our binding. Okay. So Jesus brings reconciliation. So promote reconciliation through the planting of churches uh, in, in different areas. That's to counter spiritual emptiness. What did Jesus do? He equipped servant leaders. He equipped servant leaders. Jesus appointed 12 as apostles that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach. Okay, here are four steps to discipleship. I do it and show you how. You watch me do it. You do it and I watch you and then you do it on your own. That's what Jesus did to his disciples in three years. He says, I have given you an example to follow. Now do as I have, uh, as I have done to you or in front of you. So he equipped servant leaders. Later on in the, in the New Testament, he says, don't lord it over people. Don't be like the, lead, the other leaders. Don't throw your weight around. You are to be a servant. In John 13, he says, if you're not willing to get on your knees, if you're not willing to wash 
feet along with me or let me wash your feet, you have no portion in me. You have no portion with me. Jesus set the order of the towel, so to speak. He set the servanthood. Okay? Servanthood doesn't mean, just now we were having this conversation about humility. Servanthood doesn't mean you act like a servant, walk like a servant, talk like a servant. You're completely, you know, effaced, no identity, no. Nah, -uh. God has given us color, social media, personality. He's given us everything we can use to bring out, but it must be used for the services and the purposes of God to serve others. All right. So equip servant leaders. Number three, A is to assist the poor. A is assist the poor. The spirit of the Lord has appointed me to preach the good news to the poor. God loves the poor. Yes, Jesus said you will always have the poor, but God loves the poor. In fact, the proverb says if you lend to the poor, it's like giving to God. Lending to the poor is like giving to God. So God has a heart for the poor. He says, if you get a, water, a bottle of water to the least of these, a glass of water to the least of these. Of course, he was talking to the, his own people, but his own people were also poor. Assist the poor. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It's going to get very practical in the next few minutes. Okay, and number, and number four, C, is care for the sick. Care for the sick. Jesus cared for the sick. Jesus went to every town while preaching the good news, teaching everyone and healing every disease and sickness. Some churches have monopolized on the healing ministry and some churches have monopolized on the teaching ministry. Okay? But we are all to be involved in the fivefold ministry of Christ and we are to be part of what Christ did. Jesus just didn't only preach. Jesus just didn't only do miracles. He was all about needs of the people. And lastly, he says, let the little children come to me. Wherever Jesus went, crowds flocked to him and he taught them. He always taught them and he educated them. He wanted them to be enlightened. He wanted them to know. I have come that you may know. I have come that you may know. Let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. Jesus' model of ministry is the antidote to the world's biggest problems. And as you look at how Jesus solved it, you see five things. You see five things. You see plant churches. You see educate, uh, equip servant leaders, assist the poor, care for the sick, educate the next generation. How can we continue the mission of the Lord Jesus? How can we continue the mission of the Lord Jesus? When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Interesting word, peace. Peace. Ordinary people, empowered by God, making a difference together wherever they are that my brothers is the peace plan my brothers and sisters is the peace plan understanding you need a man of peace understanding you come to give peace and if you break up the acronym of peace p plant churches e equip servant leaders a assist the poor c care for the sick e educate the next generation say it together with me the definition of the peace plan ordinary people empowered by God making a difference together wherever they are again ordinary people empowered by God making a difference together wherever they are right so that my brothers and sisters is the peace plan planting and partnering churches partnering and planting churches you make the local church the hero you make the local church the hero so I come and I come to Almora and I find your church and my church comes to serve your church to strengthen your church and I leave there without logos without egos without logos without egos you walk out of there <clears throat> glorify the local church strengthen the local church let the local church be the pastor because they come in with such pomp and show do such big programs and the local pastor is not able to sustain that. He's not able to keep it up. And with, with the, as they come, the life comes and the life goes with them also. Right? And then you have this guy and he's like, he's not, we need to empower our local churches. I'm going to get to the heart of the matter. Strong Indian churches. Strong Nepal churches. Strengthening small Indian churches. Small Nepal churches. Say amen. amen. Churches, we need to start serving. We need to stop being the churches that are served by the West. I renounce this in Jesus' name. We cannot anymore, 
We are too well equipped, well educated and well connected to be on the receiving end anymore. This is not the 60s. We didn't just receive independence. We have now become a global power. And it's time for the church to kind of catch up with where the government is. Modi or no Modi. <coughs> and the churches have to say, no, I can do it. Pastors should be able to say, I can work. I can work. I, I can earn some money. I can empower my church. I can, I can raise people. I can develop people. We need to get out of that mindset first. If you don't give me, if you don't pay for me, if you don't take care of me, I can't do the Great Commission. If you, if you give me, if you support me, then I'll do the Great Commission. And we still have the, the American dream. The American dream is to get some American church to back. Now if they, out of their generosity, chose to do that, and God in his sovereignty hooked you up with one of the, praise God. But are you going to wait till that happens? Or are you going to say, we're going to do it? I can, ta I can train 10 churches. Pastor Jerry, you, you taught me this? Give me the notes. Give me the notes. I'll change my name. I'll change my name. I'll go teach 10 churches. I can do it. I've got influence. I can walk. I can run. I can, I can take the car. I can take the metro. I can go teach 10, 10 pastors. I can do it. Chandigarh, I can do it. Right? Chhattisgarh, I can do it. Are you hearing my heart? Yeah. We can do it. We are Indian pastors. Nepali pastors. We are educated. We are resourced. And we have within our country the resources. You have first to start believing that. And we can do the peace plan. Thanks to the peace plan, we can work together in order to do this. This is not about me. This is about the church and this is about the Lord Jesus in our country. Our country needs to stop thinking that we are here to convert everybody. Our country needs to start believing we are here to serve everybody. And when we do that, perhaps they will be converted. But that's not the goal. Because God will take care of that. And even our definition of conversion is different. So let's not even get into that. Right? Heart to heart. That's what I wanted to share with you. Let's go over it all over again. Plant and partner churches. Number two. Equip servant leaders. Equip servant leaders. Where will you find servant leaders except in the church? So you develop servant leaders. Now when I say servant leaders, are you thinking pastors? No. -uh. Don't think pastors. You have engineers, you have doctors, you have uh, uh, strategists, you have analysts, you have CAs, you have all sorts of people in there. They are leaders. They are leaders in their community. Teach them servant spirit. Teach them servant spirit. Teach them justice. Do you know that people are poor not because of economy but because of justice? Did you know that? Did you know that people are poor in our country not because of economy but because of justice? We have enough money for everybody to eat. But we have injustice in our country and we have corrupt leadership. So you have to teach servant leadership. So if every one, out of every three, if at least one was a servant leader, it would change. We would start affecting this country and, this, and the halls of, of power very quickly. The church can do that. Because the church has got people like that coming to our church. Or oh, invite them. Invite them. Invite a local MLA. Invite a local SHO. And say, we, just, you know, we were praying for you all this month. And we but say the truth. That you were actually praying. And then bring him and say, we would like to pray for you. Can we pray for you? Who will do that? 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 Nobody is asking you to come worship. We are saying, we want to pray for you. Come. And we start praying for them firstly. And then call them and pray for them. Right there. We can, then I say, okay, we have 10 volunteers available. SHO. Okay, MLA. Local MA. We've got 10 volunteers available from our church would like to do help with this project or that project or this uh, this government you know that this projects are happening in your in your locality you could take the credit that's the beauty of the church take the credit but we'd like to serve if we start getting involved like this we will change the way our country and our government sees us we will change the way we, they see us and that is our job to hold hands and to change the definition of the way we are seen as a country, as, as a religion, as a community. And firstly, we need to unite. Number three, assist the poor. Assist the poor. Give a hand up, not a handout. Give a hand up. Do you have that? Give a hand up, not a... Is it written there? Yeah. Let me explain that. A handout is Dasurupe. A handout is 
जा यार ये कैसे लो जाओ जाओ विंडो से दूर हो जाओ ओके सो लेट मी टेक दैट एग्जांपल अ बेगर कम्स टू योर डोर योर कार डोर एट द रेड लाइट और एट योर स्कूटर व्हाट एवर योर बेगर कम्स टू यू टैप्स यू ऑन द नी और नॉक्स ऑन योर कार विंडो एंड व्हाट डू यू डू व्हाट डू यू डू देयर आर टू ऑप्शंस वन ऑप्शन इज रोल द विंडो डाउन गिव हिम 10 रुपीस यू नो जस्ट द वे लाइक पीपल गिव ऑफरिंग Did I say that out loud? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, <laughs> give him ten rupees, and you feel, you feel, there they are, and you keep the loose change also, or there they are. And did you change his life? No. Did you make it better or worse? Worse. How? He may not even get the money, and you have encouraged and empowered a system. which was already working in our country and that's why because of religious religiosity in our country everybody wants to feel good for 3 seconds it costs them hardly anything you know they're giving cash away and people are living off the guilt of a nation now what do you as a believer need to feel guilty about nothing if anything we don't want to do that what do we want to do i want to help him to learn to earn 10 rupees every 10 minutes so i give him a polishing shoe box or i give him some skills or i work i get 10 10 kids together and raj uh, what's his name rajesh no uh, joshua joshua goes on gets 10 guys together and he simply gives them a simple skill and the 10 guys go out and they earn money and they look after themselves and he's gotten the money he's gotten the respect he's gotten the dignity and more than anything he's gotten them hope of a future that's called transformational that's called sustainable Absolutely. and pens yeah you yeah you buy it from there so we are talking about a uh, a transformational model of ministry that actually changes their life changes their life but to give you an example we haven't yet started it's in the pipeline right now but i've introduced a project to my church called 100 families out of poverty and have introduced it to my men's fellowship and the men are expected with their families to adopt one slum home one slum family and help that family get a job for the guy get a job for the woman get a get school get the kids into school get them rehab get them counseling get their documentation aadhar you know ration card what are the basics and slowly move them out of that existence and into a lower middle class middle middle class existence help them set up change their lives completely forever remove them from the influences if he's got drinking get him rehab if she's been raped or she's been uh, had had several medical procedures or whatever has been the case especially if you're a young girl and you're in a in a slum for sure for sure your body's a mess get the medical treatment required all of these things whatever is required one family caring for another family one by one by one get 100 families out of poverty that's one weird way and that's what can be done now if we do that successfully and then i come to your church and i come to your church and i come to 100 other churches and say 100 of you can you also do this over the next one year 2020 at the end of 2020 how many people would be out of poverty how many families 1100 families would be out of poverty and once you do that it's going to catch up and who would have done it the church who has the compassion to do it the church who has the way with all to do it the church who has the motivation to do it the church can the government do that because it takes love and compassion to stick with a person who doesn't want to change right so the church has the two things the government doesn't have and that is compassion and people who are willing to work for free and there are a lot of people in your church who really really need to work they really need to get out there and surf they really need to find a ministry so assisting the poor care for the sick care for the sick looks like essentially helping people with their basics in hygiene and medicine so that they don't get to a place where they need to go to a doctor or go to a hospital did i make sense did i make sense we're talking about health uh hygiene basic sanity 
sa uh, sanitation, basic sanitation, basic sanitation, and <laughs> and and in villages, small towns, so that we are helping and working. Now, does the government do that? Does the government ever do stuff like that? Medical camps. NGOs do it. Can a church hook up with an NGO without getting all bent out of shape ego-wise? Yes, we can. Can you help somebody else and walk away without getting any credit? Yes, we can. That's what the church is good. We should be good at humility. Right? So, uh, is someone already doing it? Let's join hands. Brother, you're already working in the slums. In Dwarka. Why should I come in Dwarka? We have our own ministry. Why? Why? He's there. Join hands. But I disagree with his uh, theology about Christ. He believes Christ was a woman. And I, I, I mean, really, if it's that, then maybe you want to really think about it. I'm just kidding. Okay, so I don't, like, I don't like the way they all dress in their church. Yeah? Okay. Can we work together? Yes, we can work together. Does my church need to come in and take over? No, it doesn't. Do you get what I'm going with this? We are not going to touch our country. We are not going to win our country. If we are all sitting within our four walls and holding our banner up. We are this, we are that. We are this, we are that. Especially when you are, your cultural identity and your theological identity and your uh, ethnic identity comes before your Christian identity. Do you know what I am talking about? <laughs> Christian fellowship comes after that. Church comes after that. And first and foremost, we this is who we are. You're not. <laughs> and we're putting a divide. You rakhlo, yaar. You keep your egos, keep everything, but let's work together. Let's work together. So that was a little bit of the medical thing. We're going to get more into that. Let me, uh, and then educating the next generation. My wife set up a little uh, ministry for people who, construction workers, children, who are smoking uh, like the, they either they give them Benadryl or they give them whatever and then they put them to sleep for the whole time while the construction workers are working and they're lying there in the sand and all that uh, oh, terrible situations so we took the kids aside we started working with them to educate them in basics reading writing and um, something else so comprehension so that's an area we're going to get into that right away let's finish this up how is the peace plan different from other strategies everybody's doing a great job everybody's doing missions how is this different number one Let's look at the seven pillars of the peace plan. Okay, P I L L A R S. Pastor Rick is really good at this stuff. Purpose driven. First of all, foremost is purpose. Driven. Peace is a purpose driven strategy built on the five purposes given in the Great Commandment, Great Commission, and the specific instructions that Jesus gave to the mission teams he sent out in Matthew chapter 10 and Luke chapter 10. So we are purpose driven in that we are wanting all five purposes to be met and we are in balance of all five purposes. P I involves every member in the church uh -uh. no it's not those five people who are over and through and they go for everything they're in the choir also they're in the research team also they're in the camp committee also they're in the everything and then they also go out no we're talking about every single person out on missions all right i is for every member it is a lay movement it is not a full-time missions movement it's not about paying anybody you will not be paying anybody there's no money involved. People are getting off their backsides and getting involved in ministry. L is links congregations. Peace is a grassroots church to church. Underline. Peace is a grassroots church to church strategy. Your church with my church. My church with that church. That church with another church. Peace to peace. Uh, sorry. A church to church strategy. Linking congregations around the world to make a difference together. Why? Because together we can do a lot more in Delhi, Ghaziabad, Faridabad, Kathmandu. We can do a lot more than my own church alone. Oh, no. I, we got to get together. L is led by groups. Peace is a small group strategy. So you take your small group, care group, cell group and let a group make a ministry together. Let the group decide to work together. And they bond and they get excited and they get, you know, they pool their resources together a is attacks all five giants it's a peace plan a peace plan strategy it attacks all five giants we don't just do one thing some churches are very good at only one thing or two things again pastor's heart that's it it attacks all five giants r it respects the local church 
It respects the local church. It's not one church coming in telling another church how you're supposed to do things and walk away feeling good about yourself. Respects the local church. Peace is a church-based strategy that makes local congregations the heroes. Lifting up the local pastor and say, he's your man. He's your man. Go to him. He's the guy. And make him feel strengthened. Make him feel encouraged. Make him feel resourced. That we believe local churches, lead, local church leaders understand local needs the best. Believe that he knows better than you. You may have Google and all your strategies and everything, but the local guy knows better than you. Oh, that's going to take some humility. <laughs> that's going to take some humility. The guy's been there. He's grown up there. You know, that's one of the reasons I stuck around in Delhi. You know, I married a, a, a girl from Kazakhstan and I had, you know, some early, early on in my life, I had options to go into the different, I wanted to go to Kazakhstan or Russia to plant churches. I had a burden for, you know, for Europe because the gospel came from there. You know, when we were kids and the missionaries came and, we, and now they're like atheist countries. So I was like, I want to go back there. And take, but the Lord like says, no, you are Diliwala. You are Diliwala. You stand right here in Vishwayur Kendra and you can say, what you want? Nobody can say a thing. Come, get me. Kyagarogan. Local home, yaar. JJ Colony, Satani Gadan Kamalu. There is a certain, you know, there's a certain strength. So we've got to believe in the local fella. We've got to get behind him. And we, when you go to a new place, he makes your ministry more effective because you believe in him. Just remember what I said. Okay? Attacks all five giants. R respects the local church. And finally, S sends to the whole world. We send to the whole world. Because you're working through churches. And the church is everywhere in the world. Everywhere in the world. In fact, if you go to the moon, there's probably a Malu church there. <laughs> <laughs> I have a pretty good hunch about that. I mean, it's probably there. Yeah. So, send to the whole world. Peace is a global strategy. Our goal is to mobilize churches in every nation to reach the final 3,000 unreached, unengaged tribes. All right. What will it take? Real quick. We must adopt a God's agenda. Okay. What is God doing? What is he doing? How is he doing? Who is he using? We must adopt God's agenda. Number two. We must abandon all distraction. We must abandon all distraction. We cannot lose focus now in getting involved with theological issues and all of those other church dividing issues and money issues. We need to stay focused. Number three, we must appropriate God's power. We cannot do this on our own. We need to pray fast and move as an army. Number four, we must answer God's call. We must answer God's call. Look at the verses that... God is saying, I have a plan. I want you to go. Will you take it to the nations? Will you be my voice?